Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospective, Part 8. We are on to issue number 2 of Nintendo Power for September and October of 1988, and this one is going to be something of a doozy. Our cover for this issue features Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest, and one of the magazine's most controversial covers, although one I kind of like. The cover features a man dressed as Simon Belmont, holding Dracula's severed head in his hand, as well as have the items that Simon is supposed to collect over the course of the game sitting on a stone in the background. It's a hell of a second cover. Reportedly, parents sent in letters complaining about this cover to Nintendo, saying that the picture gave their kids nightmares. Now, I have no doubt that Nintendo received the letters, but considering that kids kind of have a taste for the macabre, as demonstrated by the by the success of films like The Corpse Bride, Nightmare Before Christmas, and Paranorman, never mind the whole long-standing traits of kids sneaking into horror films that they're probably too young to see going all the way back to the 70s, I have my doubts about whether the kids in question actually got nightmares from this cover. Our first article for this issue is for Bionic Commando. This is probably one of the tougher games for the staff to do an article on, if only because this game has a certain degree of non-linearity combined with some fairly large levels, both vertically and horizontally. The article gives us some information on the different kinds of stages, as well as advice on how to use your bionic arm, as there is no jump mechanic in the game. As far as the, the maps go, we get a map of the first enemy base, as well as the three kinds of top-down enemy encounter levels, as well as some of the neutral outpost levels in the game. Bionic Commando is hard, but it's a fair kind of hard. Basically, the difficulty in this game is primarily, but not entirely, related to the player needing to think differently about things like, for example, not being able to jump. As it is, I didn't find this that hard to adjust to, in part due to the fact that the player's bionic arm is mapped to the traditional jump button, the A button. Thus, the difficulty in the game shifts from using your reflexes to complete the game's jumping puzzles, to instead paying attention to the environment and figuring out how to use the bionic arm to navigate the game's levels, either by going up or swinging, or swinging and then doing a grab upwards, or various other things like that. Speaking of levels, the game uses a slight leveling up mechanic. As you make through the game, you will level up your character's health bar by killing enemies. Enemies you kill drop bullets, and each bullet you pick up increases your life bar by one pip. Well, or at least once you get enough bullets to level up, it increases your life bar by one pip, going up to eight pips. When you get a game over to continue, you continue at the last life bar level you were at in the game, though you lose any progress to the next life bar level. Aside from the main enemy base levels in the game, there are also top-down levels, like in the original Commando, where you make your way from the bottom to the top, past constantly respawning groups of enemies, until you reach the exit. These levels aren't quite as fun, but fairly manageable if you use a controller with turbo fire to just basically dump, because you can get away with that. All of that said, this is a fun game, and the only thing it's really missing is some sort of password option to let you continue your game later if you weren't able to beat the game in one, in one session for one reason or another. Though, really, the game is still just fine without it. Next up is our first shoot 'em up in Nintendo Power, and the spiritual sequel to Gradius. Life Force, released in Japan under the title of Salamander. The article features profiles of all of the bosses, as well as highlights for the first two stages, in addition to more in-depth strategies for beating those two stages of bosses. I've previously reviewed this game, back when I was doing written recaps of Nintendo Power, and back when I reviewed it then, I enjoyed the game immensely. I still do. It does right everything that Gradius did right, and then goes one step further. In Gradius, the Konami code gave you all power-ups on that life, uh, but only on that life. In Life Force, it gives you 30 lives as with Contra. In Gradius, when you died, it sent you back basically to a checkpoint. In Life Force, you come right back where you were. In Gradius, you had limited numbers of continues, replicating only having a certain number of quarters when you're playing the game in the arcade. Life Force has unlimited continues. Gradius gave you the double shot, where you had one shot firing straight forward and another one shooting upwards at a sort of 45-ish degree angle. Whereas here you have a spread shot. It's kind of like Konami looked at Gradius, slapped their head, and said, Oh, right, we're developing this for a home console. 
we don't need to eat people's quarters because home consoles don't have uh, slots on them for quarters. Duh. And then design the game accordingly. The end result is a game which is, in my opinion, better than Gradius in pretty much every respect. Now we come to our cover game, Castlevania 2. For the game, we have maps of the first several areas, as well as for the first three mansions, Berkeley, Lauber, and Brom. Here's the part where I say something controversial. This game, Castlevania 2, is not as bad as its reputation would suggest. That's not to say this game doesn't have some significant problems. It does. However, in my opinion, the reputation this game has gotten thanks to the angry video game nerd making this one of his first reviews and one of his most frequently viewed reviews is very much undeserved. The game's controls, to be fair, honestly are excellent. The jumps feel just as good as they did in the original Castlevania, though I'd say they're not quite as good as the jumping controls in Castlevania 4, but then again, this is an 8-bit game. Super Castlevania 4 is a 16-bit console game, so that's asking a lot. The game, because it's RPG-ish, necessitates a certain degree of grinding for item upgrades, but I'd argue that that's not unique to this game. Indeed, when you get to some of the more truly Metroidvania um, games in the series, like Symphony of the Night, those problems are aggravated even further, particularly considering that in those games often there would only be one shop in the game, and you'd have to hunt it down and find it first. And theoretically, you could possibly even go the whole game without even finding the shop in the first place. So, instead, the game's primary problems are kind of twofold. First is, the boss fights are few and far between. One of the notable and famous things about Castlevania, the first game and all the games afterwards, were the boss fights against Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, Medusa, and so forth. Whereas here, you only have two. You have one against Death and one against Dracula at the end of the game. The second problem is with the translation, and this is where I really agree that this is a major problem at the time of the game's release. The Japanese version of the game had some townspeople who gave you good advice, and some townspeople who gave you bad advice. And an early person early on in the game would tell you as much. The English version, on the other hand, didn't really make this as clear, and the good advice the townspeople gave really wasn't that helpful in this version because of the poor translation. Thus, the poor translation, combined with the secrets that you have to find to complete the game, you can't beat it without finding them, and how obtuse some of these puzzles are without any sort of hints, means that the game is almost impossible to beat by most people without the use of a guide of some sort, either through, at the time, Nintendo Power Magazine, or now through sites like Game FAQs, or articles and tips and wikis and other web pages. This is unfortunate and probably could have been avoidable if at the time the people doing the translation at Konami had recognized that they really couldn't maintain the spirit of the dialogue in this game and had instead decided to drop the bad hints and rewritten some of the advice dialogue and that sort of thing to make things more cohesive and more helpful to players. Um, but that's the main thing is really the translation is the game's biggest problem, and how it affected gameplay at the time is what makes it, gives it its reputation as being so terrible. Nowadays, in the age of the internet, when we have game FAQs and you have all sorts of ways to have these strategy guides with you when you're playing the game with limited hassle and more or less for free, it really makes, takes that whole issue out of the equation. I would definitely actually recommend giving this game a try. Um, don't go, oh, I'm going to try and beat this game without strategy guides or that sort of thing. Just get a fact, have it open in another window if you're playing it in a browser, in, in an emulator, or have it open on your computer screen while you're playing the game on your television, on your console, or something like that, and give this game a shot. I think you'll find it worth it. We get an article revisiting Super Mario Bros. 2 covering several additional levels that weren't covered last issue. As I've already reviewed this game, let's move on. Next, we get an article covering the first brawler to hit store shelves for the NES, well, almost the first brawler, and one which came before Double Dragon, which was covered way back in Fun Club News, Renegade. We get descriptions of the moves in the game, as well as some of the level environments. This game sucks. Really, for all the 
crap that Castlevania 2 gets, this game deserves so much more. This game basically consists of a series of not even like levels, but set pieces, where you fight off wave after wave of identical enemies in the same environment until the boss comes out, then you fight him or her. Occasionally, some enemies will come in with a weapon to change things up, and this weapon gives them some additional reach, but these enemies, unlike, say, enemies in basically every other significant brawler, don't drop their enemy their weapons when they're knocked down. Further, like in Double Dragon 2, which comes later, attacks are based in what direction you're facing. The A button has you attack to the right, the B button has you attack to the left. If you're attacking in front of you, you punch, if you're attacking behind, you kick. Kicks do more damage and have more reach but are slower. However, you don't pick which direction you're facing in for your attacks. The game automatically sets your facing based on the closest enemy, which causes problems with enemies with weapons because your punches don't have the reach to engage the enemy and clobber them until, well, you're within range for getting hit with their weapon, which means you've got hit several times before you get a chance to hit the enemy. So, really, honestly, I don't care what method you prefer to choose to use it, to use to play it, don't play this game. This game is terrible, there's no reason to have it, there's no reason to play it, there's no reason to buy it, and if somebody gives this to you as a gift and they know what they're giving you, maybe you should reconsider their, your friendship with that person. Continuing with revisiting games that were covered earlier, there's an article covering RC Pro-Am, which I'm not going to review again for the same reason that I'm not re-reviewing Super Mario Bros. 2. There's nothing more to talk about. The classified information column has some stuff for Kid Nicky, as well as Renegade, and a cheat which Nintendo actually already ran on their own, the Treasure Room Strategy for Kid Icarus. Okay. So, for Howard and Nestor, this installment has Nestor doing magic game tricks using tricks from Nintendo Power. Howard catches on to this and exposes him, in the process letting, in, letting us know that in Super Mario Bros. 2, using the potion in areas with lots of grass is important. In Counselor's Corner, we have a whole bunch of Legend of Zelda questions, and as well as advice for finding the warp zones in Super Mario Bros., which... Even I found out on my own fairly easily. When I first played the game, back when I was like, eight. Next up is a game which wears its anime and manga adaptation credentials on its sleeve. Gogo 13. This manga for downtrodden salarymen looking for escapist fantasies where you can be a personality-free assassin who can wrap any woman in the world around his finger with sex in the missionary position who uses a custom M16 not because it's a practical sniper rifle but because the M16 looks cool in the 70s has a video game for the NES which has made it out to the U US. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of GoGo13. Can you tell? Seriously. James Bond, when written at his worst, his absolute bottom-of-the-barrel worst, is a more interesting character than Duke Togo at his best written. Seriously, Bond uses wit and charm to seduce women, he is clever, he is witty, he is funny, even when he's at his most gadget using um, in space stuff. Basically, when he's at, when he's, even when he's Roger Moore, he's funny and capable of letting loose with a dry one-liner, or a less dry one-liner, but something. Some, something to show that there is something operating back here behind the eyes, outside from just kill, kill, kill. Whereas, with Duke Togo, his seduces women because, oh, it's Duke Togo. It is, he is the mimetic seducer? I don't know, it's like, Oh, it's Duke Togo. He must be good. In, he's good in the sack, so therefore I, women jump on him. And it's it's really a misogynic view of misogynistic view of women in the comics in terms of every woman, every woman in uh, in GoGo Thirteen wants to get in Duke Togo's pants, and j just by seeing this, because he is Duke Togo, just because he is GoGo Thirteen, and. It's not like he's depicted as being an excellent lover or anything like that, or sensitive to women's needs or anything like that. No, no, it's it's generic missionary sex, maybe generic woman on top sex, but it's it's boring, is what it is. 
I mean, having a character who makes women, smoo- women swoon and men tremble in fear just at the look of his face, without him doing anything, saying anything, and then have him just basically being a bland, emotionless automaton doesn't make it the character a badass, despite what Daryl Surratt says, or anyone like that. Um, quite the contrary, it shows that the writing for the series is complete and utter crap. There, I said it. The writing for GoGo13 is total crap, to the point that the most interesting stories are the ones where GoGo13 barely shows up at all, and is people talking about the after effects of his work. When the title character in your series is the least interesting character in your series, then, and by, 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 by least interesting, I mean the most interesting are the bit characters, the guys in the one shot. When you're interested in them more than you're interested in the main character and what he does or how he gets out of problems, then really, it's t- it's crap. The best Batman stories aren't the ones where Batman is the goddamn Batman. It's not those. It's the ones where he shows a degree of character, depth, and emotion to him. Um, the greatest Batman moment, in my opinion, for example, of the various animated Batman works, it isn't him doing the I am vengeance, I am the knight speech from Batman the Animated Series. It's when he reveals that he's kind of already figured out whoever in Secret Identity was in Justice League, and whenever it has to go out of costume to escape the notice of this of these bad guys who've kind of taken over the earth for a while it's batman is a character who is most interesting when he's being a detect when he's either being a, a clever detective not just like beating up guys but being clever and thinking things through and you get to see the the thought processes in his brain or when he's showing his more emotional sides and that sort of thing when he's not just a grim facade. Togo 13 doesn't have that. He is always just the grim facade. We don't know... I mean, Duke Togo is, even the series considered to be somewhat a pseudonym. We don't know what his real name is. We don't know where he's from. We don't know where he's born. He exists to be a blank slate for, really, Japanese salarymen to... In, inject themselves onto to uh, as the worst kind of escapist fantasy the saddest kind of escapist fantasy it is not the escapist fantasy of a character who is more clever than we wish we are than we are or the escapist fantasy of a character who has who shows emotional depth who shows intelligence who shows wit and charm it's the escapist fantasy of a character who is totally emotionless, and we pretend, and in the hopes that that it fits every potential reader, and that's the con- that's the consequence fits none. It's it's basically a it's target it's like it's it's like the target audience they, they want for people who enjoy this, like who truly enjoy this, most those who enjoy it irony or nostalgia or because it's so bad it's good, is, like, people who are so, I mean, it's in a sexual sense, so impotent in their lives, so, in, have so little agency in their own lives, that they basically latch onto this character who has agency, who can do anything and everything they want to, but with no personality traits to them where they to make them feel that, oh, I wouldn't act in this way, or I'm, I don't know, so that they inject their own personality onto the character, but without giving many lines to give that personality. I mean, yes, Duke Togo speaks, but he speaks fair. fair. He's, God, the man without a name is more cool than this guy. Anyway. So, and honestly, Really, the only people who really like GoGo13, who really like him anymore, honestly, in my opinion, are people who like it, like the character either due to nostalgia, because the character's been around since the 70s and they grew up with him, um, irony, because they recognize the character is terrible, and they're sort of liking it ironically, because, oh yeah, this guy's so cool, he doesn't need a character trait, he doesn't need character 
character depth. Character depth is for weak writers. Um, people like, um, when actually they, they do like works with real character depth and they're saying that just because they want to see boobs and violence. Um, or, honestly, aging conservative Japanese businessmen who are upset about how it's unacceptable for them to sexually harass their female coworkers. Honestly, there are works in the same genre, general genre of manga that are, while maybe some are kind of still dubious in their quality, um, and in subject matter, have more interesting heroes, more interesting stories, um, than GoGo13. In fact, I will list some for you. Um, from the same creator of GoGo13, um, Takeo Saito, he did, uh, he did this manga called Hawking, which is about a uh, hotel detective in France um, during the 70s, which is currently available through JManga, which is a digital manga platform. I would recommend checking that out. I would also recommend checking out from Kazuo Koike, who is a guy who's kind of s split in how in the quality of his work. Sometimes this stuff is pretty good, like Lone Wolf and Cub. Sometimes this stuff is absolutely terrible, like Mad Bull 34. Um, in the same sort of hit, modern day hitman manga genre, there is Crying Freeman. Um, yes, this series also has lots of nudity, lots of exploitation. The character is, mimet is a mimetic sex god, but he has more depth to him. He is, it's, they set up that this is a guy who did not take up being an assassin by choice, and they give him a tragic backstory and make him give him emotional depth. They give him much more to him to make him fleshed out than Gogol Thirteen ever has been and ever will be. Um, from Kenichi Sonoda for a series which has guns and action and that sort of thing, but also with a really good sense of humor, there is Gunsmith Cats, um, which is set later. It's set more contemporaneously, 80s, 90s, maybe into the 2000s. Um, and it follows Riley Vincent, a female bounty hunter slash bond enforcement agent in Chicago who also runs a gun shop and has a really sweet car in the form of a Shelby Culper Mustang GT. Of those last two I mentioned, Crime Freeman and Gunsmith Cats, both had their most recent editions put out by Dark Horse Comics. And I believe they're, they are still in print. I recommend checking those out as well. Finally, there's Naoki Urasawa, who basically came on the scene with the manga Monster. He'd done work before this. He did the series Yarawa of a fashionable judo girl, full title, um, which kind of made it a little bit to the United States because the climax of the series was the, was the Atlanta Olympics. And the main character wanted to be on the judo team for the Olymp for the Atlanta Olympics, but he's done other works outside of that, of that outside of sports manga. Uh, some of the stuff that would fit in nicely with this is Monster, which is his big hit in the United States, um, which really got on people's radar. Which is the story of a doctor, Doctor Tenma, who treats a young patient. Um over the head, over the mayor of the town. Um, end up getting disgraced because the mayor of the town dies. Um, and it turns out that the kid he healed is a serial killer. And now, and after the kid has grown up and has become, well, killed a bunch of people and that sort of thing, Dr. Tenma realizes what he's done and has to, decides to set it right. Um, very, very good manga, also adapted to an animated, to an anime. Um, another thing that comes closer to the, the globe trotting adventure aspect of Gogo 13, as also by Urasawa, is the series Master Keaton. Now, the manga for this did not come out in the United States, unfortunately, but the anime did. Uh, it is currently out of print. Uh, it was licensed by Pioneer, um, and they were pretty good about doing big print runs of stuff, or fairly, fairly significantly sized print runs of stuff. So I would recommend looking for that at used bins or on Amazon or that sort of thing or from Netflix. Um, that is also definitely worth checking out. If you're looking for something 
better than GoGo 13, but in the same general kind of modern action globe riding adventure vein without the elements of the super fantastic. So, let's get back to the article. Returning to the article, we get information about the different gameplay modes and each of the locations in the game. Well, GoGo 13 on its own really is not a good game. The game has kind of four different types of stages. There are side-scrolling action sequences where you wander around a city as Duke Togo, trying to find clues to help you complete your mission while being attacked by various goons. There are shoot 'em up sequences where you're piloting a vehicle or scuba diving and shooting waves of enemies coming at you as you try to make your way to your destination. There are shooting gallery sequences where groups of enemies come at you and you move a set of crosshairs through the screen to target the attacking enemies and shoot them and maze sequences, where you navigate through an enemy ba base in the first person. I will admit I did not make it to the maze sequence, but I played all the other kinds of sequences, and I can reasonably come to the conclusion that this game sucks. The only thing I can say for this game, the only thing, is that the first shoot 'em up sequence, where you're in a helicopter, and the shooting gallery sequences in the first ga stage are okay. They do have their problems, particularly related to lining up shots and enemies in the shooting galleries and the shooting stages using the same pool of ammunition as everything else in the game, but still, those two sections control well, and because you gain health by killing enemies, they're a good way to recharge your health for the rest of the game. However, the walking around part of the game, on the other hand, is utter crap. Basically, you walk through the level and go into buildings. However, buildings you can go into aren't marked, so if you so you just walk up to them and press up on the controller. If nothing happens, you can't go in and keep going. If you do go in, something may happen, or someone there may tell you that you may need to co come back later. Meanwhile, as you're going through the environment, usually a city, there are people with guns who try to kill you. There are also people who come to give you clues and other pieces of information. All of these people look exactly the same. You won't know which is which until you try to kill them, or they try to kill you, whichever comes first. On the bright side, the ones who give you clues can't be killed by you, so it's the only thing stopping you from just shooting everyone at point-blank range, or just shooting everyone as they come up, is your limited ammunition pool, which you get from killing people, so, again, no real reason not to kill people, just shoot everyone who comes along. Um, so, even then, there's still problems with this as well, because... Your enemies will shoot at you while crouched. In fact, they will primarily only shoot at you while they're crouched. You, on the other hand, can only shoot while standing. And when st when you're shooting while standing, your bullets will go over your enemies' heads, and you can't crouch to go under, the under their bullets, so you just have to kind of jump over them and hope they aren't firing fast enough to make sure that you get shot anyway. Further, not all enemies who can hurt you will try to shoot you. They'll just walk up and start causing you to take damage. So again, you have to shoot every, everyone as they come. Honestly, the only reason I got as far as I did in this game is because I'm recording gameplay using an emulator, as I can't record directly from the console, and because I'm save coming like you wouldn't believe. Look, unless you're playing this game in an emulator so you can save scum, just don't play this game. We have another Metroid-styled game with Blaster Master, where you navigate this fairly large world in a tank and on foot, collecting power-ups so you can access more and more areas to eventually rescue your pet frog, because apparently the plot of the Japanese version, where the world needed saving and it was up to you to do it, was not enough motivation. We get pictures of the different bosses, but aside from the gameplay description earlier, there's no real advice given on how to actually get through the game. Blaster Master is a game which I'd say is kind of an inferior Metroid-style action-adventure game. To be fair, not being as good at being Metroid as Metroid was is at this point in the history of video games a little like not winning the Academy Award for Best Picture but still being nominated. You're one of the best in your field, and even if you didn't win, you still will have achieved something great. And actually, well, honestly, I'd say that Blaster Master changes up the Metroid formula by doing some things that I would then describe, but it's not a Metroid formula yet. This is early enough to the whole you know, concept of the Metroidvania or Metroid clone game that the best way to put it would be to say Blaster Master establishes 
the Metroid formula by putting you in a fairly large environment divided up into various zones that you navigate by platforming through the area and killing enemies and then obtaining various power-ups which allow you to access new areas, some of which will require you to kill bosses. What then changes from Metroid is that instead of having you be a person in a suit of power armor, you're in a tank. The upgrades you then get for your tank um, give you new weapons you can use, improve speed and other abilities, and additionally, you will occasionally need to get out of the tank to access various areas of the map, which in turn will let you collect more power-ups and additional ammunition. In these sections, you personally are more fragile than you are in the tank, and can also take falling damage. Further, these parts of the map that you can't access in the tank will lead you to dungeons, which you play through in a different camera angle. You play through the dungeons in a top-down perspective, and now, instead of just having your gun, you have your gun and a whole bunch of hand grenades, which you can um, throw in four directions. You then move through the environment and collect any power-ups you can find, and defeating a boss if there is one. Honestly, I had a lot of fun with this game. The controls are great, the graphics look nice, and the difficulty is reasonable. That said, I have one significant complaint in this game. As with Bionic Commando, there is no password option for this game. Yes, you can speed run this game relatively quickly, but the game rewards exploration, which means if you're going through the game for the first time and exploring it, then the game's going to take longer, which means that, well, if you can't beat the game in one sitting, there isn't an option to stop playing and come back later where you left off. The Video Shorts column this issue has, of note, a collection of old arcade titles that are getting NES releases, like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Millipede, and, as the commercials say, many more. Under pa In the Pac-Watch column, the release of Zelda 2 is still delayed, with a very limited release in November and a wider release in 1989. In the NES Journal, we have an article hyping the impending release of the Power Pad and a new SKU for the NES, that will come with the power pad, the zapper, and a 3-in-1 cartridge with Duck Hunt, World Class Track Meet, and Super Mario Brothers. We also have a profile of Rare, which is probably our first look at a 3D de a third-party developer. This in and of itself is kind of interesting, as Nintendo Power was very much aimed for kids as an entertainment magazine, but they still wanted to talk about the video game industry here, at least as far as it relates to Nintendo. I do kind of hope we get more of these as the magazine goes on, either talking about uh, developers in Japan or other developers in the United States. We also, on the entertainment front, have a rundown of upcoming TV series in the fall season. Of these three series, TV 101, Night Watch, and Dirty Dancing, none of them survived their first season. TV 101 lasted the longest, but ran into problems with being up against more successful series like Roseanne and Matlock, as well as having a controversial, very special abortion episode in the season. Dirty Dancing had precisely no one from the film in it while retelling the, the film story, which really doesn't get people who saw the film to want to watch it, and Night Watch was up against the Cosby Show, so that pretty much explains that there. In the Celebrity Profile column, we get profiles of three NFL players, Ron Morris of The Bears, Eric Dickens Dickerson of the Indianapolis Colts, and Sean Jones of the Houston Oilers. Morris had a career-ending injury in 1992 after a not particularly noticeable career, and the other two guys, on the other hand, did great. Um, Dickerson is one of the top ten rushing yards leaders in the NFL of all time and was inducted to the NFL Hall of Fame in 1999. Sean was still playing as of August of 2012, so it's nice to know that not everyone who's featured here in the when you look at the Where Are They Now file aren't doomed to obscurity, and that sort of thing. I mean, yeah, if you're not into football, you don't know who these guys are, but if you are into football, two out of three of these guys probably might be on your radar. In the mail column, we get a reminder to please, please not send them video game ideas. In the NAS Advantage column, in addition to all the various high scores, which I'm not going to go into because I'd be here all month, we also get a little cartoon with instructions on how to take your own screenshot. It kind of makes for an interesting look at things in the days before video capture cards, emulation, and personal video recorders. Finally, we get our top 30 column. Um, the number of people submitting surveys has increased dramatically for this issue, particularly since now we're on newsstands. 
So the scores have increased dramatically as well. Also, we have some people voting for Zelda 2, even though it isn't actually out yet. Shame on you. Mario 2 is also appearing on the list as well, though it hasn't broken into the top 10 yet. That may change next issue. So for my pick of the issue, or picks, uh, since we have, since my, you know, for my single player and multiplayer picks, let's kind of do a trend of this with two picks. One for a multiplayer game that you can play with a friend or play against a friend. And one that's more for a single player side of things. Um, so on single player, I put this a lot of thought, because there's a lot of good games this issue. Um, and I ultimately decided I wanted to go with something where you can probably get, where you could get this game through virtual console in addition to finding it used in various places. And also, I, I really think more people should play, and that is, in this case, Castlevania 2. Again, as I mentioned in my review text, or in, in the review voiceover, Castlevania 2 has a bad rap. A semi-deserved bad rap because at the time of the game's release, the game was unbeatable due to the trend, due to the poor translation. You needed strategy guides like the one from Nintendo Power and later and installments of the magazine with their classified information column in order to get through the game. The game, as released in the United States, was deliberately obtuse, and at the time, it wasn't very good. It was a game that rewarded pixel pitching to get through some of the puzzles. However, we live in the age of the internet. We live in an age where, for older games, the guided dammit moments are less of an issue, in my opinion. And I think this game is still good. I or This, this game is good. And the bad elements can now be kind of lessened. Because now you don't have to talk to every townsperson to get the clues to the puzzles. You can just go online and get the clues to the puzzles. All you need to do, I mean, when you can print out a strategy guide or have it open on a computer screen next to your television or on a laptop or hell, we have tablets. We have tablet computers. We have smartphones. We have a bajillion other different electronic devices that let you carry large numbers of piece of information with you in an easy-to-read fashion without using paper at any time. And because of that, a lot of the worst arguments against Castlevania kind of go away um, in terms of the poor translation uh, making the puzzles harder because of the people giving you false advice. Now this said, honestly, Castlevania 2 could probably stand with if someone to do a fan translation of the game or fan read scripting of the game to basically make the hints more useful and to get rid of the bad advice and replace it with either useful advice or um, just generic dialogue. That would be great too, but on, frankly at this point, I think Castlevania... Castlevania 2's time has finally come. And I would definitely suggest that you give it a shot. At least once. Um, so, and other than that, my multiplayer choice um, for this week, or for this issue, is Life Force. It is really one of the best shoot 'em ups of this generation of console. The controls are excellent. It has simultaneous two player, I believe it's simultaneous. Uh, the, um, but it has two player. It supports the Konami code, so you don't have to worry about your friend that's kind of sitting idle if you're too much if you're much better than he or she is. It's a fun game. It is a good game. It is definitely worth checking out. It is one of the and again, it is one of the best shooters on the NES. Period. So, in a fortnight, we'll have the next issue of Nintendo Power, issue number three. And I will see you then.